Thank you, Rick and Nancy. 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Again, we're walking through the Bible with children's Bible stories. So we're looking at the grown-up lessons in the children's Bible stories. I actually have a book of children's Bible stories that I look at as we're going through this. And if there's a story that we mention that's not in one of the uh, children's Bible stories, I'll, I'll let you know that we're putting this in here. But all these stories that we're looking at would be the ones that are familiar to us who have grown up in Sunday school and Bible school. Uh, and, of course, each one of these has a major overall lesson that's easy for kids to understand. But then there's some deeper grown-up lessons that we have to learn. And so we look at this passage of Scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I don't normally entitle uh, sermons. I don't normally have a title that I tag on them, but if I were going to tag a title on this sermon, I just can't resist the title, There's a New Kid in Town, and it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Would you stand as the scriptures read, please? <clears throat> Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, when his eyes had begun to grow dim so he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So we went and lay down. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. It shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel, at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever, for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. Now therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more. Also, if you hide anything from me, all the things that he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said to him, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. All Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you that you reveal yourself to every generation. We thank you for the people that you use. We thank you for the certainty of your word. We thank you, Father, for the stability of your word. We ask as we look at this passage of Scripture that you would bear uh, your truths into our hearts and minds. And, Father, that if we have any business to tend to today, something we need to make right, that would be done before this day is over. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
You may be seated. Thank you. Once again, as last week's passage of Scripture, we're introduced to a lot of names, and we have to, of course, do some backtracking and figure out who these people are. If this was your first time to read this passage of Scripture, it's a big question, Mark, is what's going on and what's happening here. We start with Samuel. Samuel is an answer to a prayer. A woman by the name of Hannah was very distressed because she didn't have any children. And she came too shallow to the tabernacle where sacrifices were made and where worship was done, and she was praying. She was praying for a son. Hannah prayed, but also Hannah promised. And she told the Lord, if you will give me a son, if you will let me have a, a child, and if you will let me have a son particularly, I will lend him to you all the days of his life. And what she meant was she would be willing to let him be an apprentice in the temple or the tabernacle of the Lord, an apprentice working under the priest. That meant at a particular time of his life, he would move out of the house and he would move in to a living quarters in the tabernacle of the Lord, adjoining the Lord. And, of course, we know they didn't live there in Shiloh. And it says from year to year she would come. It meant that she, they were a long way off. So she asked for the Lord to give her a son, and she promised, if you'll do this, I'll lend him to you. And she follows through. Look in chapter 1, verse 27. Chapter 1, verse 27, for this child I pray. And the Lord has granted me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. This is, of course, her report to the priest Eli concerning what God had done in her life. So we realized she makes a promise to God, and then she follows through. Now, always a good question for us, because a lot of times, we make promises to God. We make commitments to God. Sometimes they're bargaining. Sometimes they're simply we make commitments to God. Have we followed through on those? Is that something we need to be working on? But it says, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now, who is Eli? Eli is the high priest. Eli is in charge of all the worship. And all the offerings. And he is in charge of making sure everything is done according to the law when it comes to the temple, the tabernacle, the altar, the worship, the sacrifices, all the things that have to do with that. He's the man that's responsible for this. Now, we look at Eli, we see something very disappointing. Eli is a backslidden priest in a backslidden country. Eli has a family problem. He's got an enormous family problem. His sons are mentioned in God's message to Samuel. His sons are a big problem. He has a family problem. They are priests in name, but not in practice. But they are holding to position of a priest, but not filling that position according to God's word, so we have a big problem. What's the problem? Well, back up chapter 2. In verse 12, the sons of Eli were corrupt. Now, this is the New King James Version. The King James Version and other English translations say the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. Well, whose sons were they? Eli's or Belial? Who is this Belial? A son of Belial is also a term which means corrupt or vile, or they were sons of the devil. The sons of Eli were sons of the devil, totally given over to him. They were corrupt. What did they do? And then the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, and that would be a lamb or of a bull, when the people offered the sacrifice, the priest's servant would come in with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or the kettle or the cauldron or the pot, 
the priest would take for himself all that the flesh had brought up. And they did so in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. This was a procedure outlined specifically in the law, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, and that way the priest would be taken care of. But it was a specific procedure. Now, verse 15. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for roasting to the priest. He will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. That was not according to God's plan. That was not according to God's instruction concerning true worship and sacrifice. They were tired of eating the stewed meat. They wanted to have raw meat so they could have their own cookout. That's exactly what they wanted. We want grilled meat. We don't want boiled meat, so we want to take that. So the priests were saying, I want to do it this way. Look in verse 16. If a man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, he would then answer him, no, you must give it now. If not, I will take it by force. Now, is that some way for a preacher to talk? He said, you're going to give it to me now, or I'll take it by force. Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. And look at this. For the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Now, it was bad enough that they distorted the worship practice. It was bad enough that they used their position for personal financial gain while, of course, violating God's rules. It was bad enough that they were heavy-handed and threatened people who tried to do it the right way. But here's the worst part of it. People hated to come to church because these guys were so corrupt. They were mean, they were vile, they were ugly, they were dirty. They played dirty. All of God's people in the country, it says they abhorred, they hated to come do the offering. We've got some serious problems here. Of course, we see a little bit later on, not only did they have problems in their professional lives, they had problems in their personal lives, they lost all regard to God's standards of morality. They did some things con connected with the people that were assembled at the temple that were vile and ugly and as bad as it could get. How did it get to this? How did it get to this? Well, there's a national problem. You see, Eli is a backslidden priest. He's got a family problem, and the Bible specifically says in God's word to Samuel, Samuel knew all this and he didn't restrain his sons. He didn't correct them. And that was his job. Whether they were his sons or some other priest, that was his job to make sure this was done correctly. Much more the responsibility because his job as a daddy was to make sure his boys behaved in a way that was appropriate to the Lord regardless of their profession. So he's got a twofold problem here. But the national problem is outlined here. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Now, King James says the word of the Lord is precious. The Hebrew word means both things. And I agree, the word of the Lord is precious. That's another sermon. The Bible says the word of the Lord is like gold, like silver, better than rubies, better, sweeter than honey, better than bread, a light to our path. That's a whole different sermon. But the same word says the, Lord of, the word of the Lord was rare because anything that's rare is precious. You know why diamonds are so expensive? Gold is so expensive? There's not as much of that. But we do know concerning the context here, the word of the Lord was far from precious to the people of the country. Well, remember, this was still in the time of the judges. It was a turning point where God turned over the leadership of his country from judges to a prophet named Samuel. But at this time, it was still the time of the judges. Well, if you remember from last week, the last verse of the book of Judges says there was no king in Israel in those days, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. Then you back up, of course, chapter 3, verse 11, and it says the children 
of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and that is repeated probably eight to ten times. So we understand the summary of the era in which they lived. God's word was not precious. It was not valuable to them. It was rare in those days. It was scarce. And specifically, the proclaimed word was scarce. Nobody was preaching the truth anymore. Nobody was telling the people what they needed to hear anymore. And the word of God was rare. The proclaimed word of the Lord was scarce. And then it says there was no widespread revelation. What that means is God quit talking to them. Oh, they still had his word. That wasn't precious to them. That didn't mean anything to them, obviously. Their lifestyle proved it didn't mean anything to them. They may have claimed to be the people of the book, but they were not living like the people of the book. And so it says there was no widespread revelation. You see, because God's word has been repeatedly ignored and pushed to the sidelines in their their lives, God brings judgment on the house of Israel. And his judgment is his silence. You see, that happened next generation, King Saul. King Saul decided he didn't like the rules of God, and he decided he would do things his own way, and he offered a sacrifice even though he was not qualified, and Samuel called his hand on it. But he didn't have any regard. He was the king. He didn't need God's word to govern his life, so he pushed God's word out of his life. He's going to do things his own way. Then it came time for him to go up against the Philistines. So here he comes. He's running to God. God, is it okay for me to go to battle against them today or not? Silence. God didn't give him any instructions. But why is that? Because he ignored the instructions he already had. And so God's silence was his judgment. Interesting passage of scripture over in Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2. Give you time to turn. It's right before the book of Jonah. Right after the book of Joel. It's about three or four pages. The book of Amos starts off with God's judgment on a lot of the surrounding countries that had been a thorn in the side of Israel for generations. So, the Hebrew reader of the book of Amos would get all excited because God's raining down judgment on all these enemies of Israel. In chapter 2 of the book of Judges, all of a sudden the tone changes. And God begins to talk about Israel's sin. In Amos chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl and defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Verse 11, I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is this not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Stop that. We don't want to hear that. That's too hard preaching. You're always mad at something. You're always pointing your finger. Stop that. We do not want to hear that kind of preaching today. Well, look in chapter 8, verse 11. God talks about judgment coming on the house of Israel. And he says specifically this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God. I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You see, 
We come to the point in our lives, a lot of times we don't want to hear what God has to say. Because what God has to say cramps our style, interferes with uh, our activities, kind of keeps us from doing maybe some of the things we want to do. So a lot of times, God is repeatedly asking for a life of commitment, a life of excellence, a life of real purpose, a life of genuine meaning. However, that has to do with some discipline and giving up some things and doing some things that we don't want to do. So we tell God, stay out of my life. Stay out of my life. You're always interfering. All the things that are fun, all the things that are profitable, all the things that are easy. Stay out of my life. This is too hard. And then sooner or later, God says, as you wish, I'll stay out of your life. And you won't hear from me again. You remember Herod. Herod had had it with John the Baptist. Herod had married his brother's wife. Brother was still alive for then. John the Baptist called his hand on it. He pointed his big, long, bony finger and said, Herod, you're an adulterer, and this is not according to the law of God. Well, that made Herod mad, but it sure enough made his wife mad. And you know the story. While Herod, ignoring all the rules of decency, called for his stepdaughter to come and dance in front of him, and he was so encapsulated and captured, and he was so enraptured about her in front of all of his court and all of his nobles, he said, name whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And she said, Got to go talk to Mama first. Went to talk to Mama, and she said, Give me John the Baptist's head on a plate. And Herod did that. Total disregard for God's rules, total disregard for decency. Then he beheaded John the Baptist because he dared call his hand on him. Now, fast forward. Jesus is brought forward to Herod. You see this in the book of Luke. Jesus brought forward to Herod on the day of his crucifixion. It says Herod was so glad to see Jesus. He had heard all these things about Jesus, and he was hoping Jesus would do a trick for him. And it says that he questioned Jesus with many words. Hey, Jesus, what about this? Hey, Jesus, what about that? And he would ask Jesus something. Jesus never spoke. Tell me something, Jesus. Never said a word. Show me a trick. Never said a word. I need to hear from you now. Tell me who you are. Tell me what you are. Answer this question. Thundering silence. Herod wanted to hear from Jesus. Just talk to me. Nothing. He had ignored him. He had pushed God out of his life and all things decent. Leave me alone. God left him alone. You see, the silence of God was the judgment of God. But we understand God still had a message. So God turns from the generation of Eli. And from the generation of his sons, and he turns to the next generation, Samuel. You see, God still has a message, but God's going to deliver it through somebody else. Samuel, of course, is called a child here, but Samuel's about 12 years old. Samuel's a teenager. We see in Scripture, a lot of times when God wants to do something big, God will choose a teenager. God uses our teenagers. You don't have to wait till you're all grown up for God to do something with you. He can do something with you right now. He was about 12 years old. Let's look at the contrast between Samuel and the generation in which he lived. In chapter 2, verse 12, the sons of Eli were corrupt. They didn't even know the Lord. In verse 17, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. But now look in the very next verse. Verse 18. But Samuel ministered before the Lord. The sons of Eli were very corrupt. Their sin was very great. But here's Samuel, 
12 years old, working for the Lord. That's what we have. And then it says, of course, that he, verse 21, Samuel grew before the Lord. Wow, what a contrast. These guys were over here doing their own thing, and the people of Israel hated. Now, un, unseen by everybody else, here was Samuel working for God and growing in the Lord. So, God turns to a new generation. So perhaps it's going to be a new approach. Perhaps after all these people have ignored the word of God and the heavy-handed rules of God and all the outdated morals of God, perhaps, perhaps we're going to get a brand new fresh message. Maybe our message is a little bit easier to digest. Maybe something's a little bit more relevant for the time in which we have. New messenger, same message. Look very close at what God told Samuel. Verse 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 3. The Lord said to Samuel, I will do something in Israel at which both of the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In the day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house. What was his message? Everything he had spoken concerning his house. Look in verse 13. I have told him concerning his sons. Now you tell him concerning his sons. Same message. God had sent another prophet, an unnamed prophet, in to talk to Eli about his sons. Now he has a new messenger. Did the message change? Absolutely not. We go a little bit further. Verse 14. Therefore, I have sworn, I have sworn, past tense, I have sworn to the house of Eli. Three different times he comes to Samuel, and three different times he says, this is my message, the message I've already told Eli. My message did not change. New messenger, brand new generation, same message. Why is that? God's truths of right and wrong, good and evil, do not change. Ever. God's truths of right and wrong do not change ever. They are not affected by human opinion or changing circumstances. Biblical principles of decency and morality and truth cannot be changed by popular opinion. They will not be outvoted by legislation. They will not be overruled by the high court's rulings. They will not be canceled by the media elite. God's truths are God's truths, and no high court, no president, no king can change that, or even the high priest couldn't change it. God's truths stay constant from generation to generation, no matter what changes may come within that generation. So he got a new messenger, but he had the same message. God's message to us remains constant from messenger to messenger and audience to audience. I'm reminded if you look in the New Testament, and after 400 years of silence, John the Baptist comes on the scene. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, you know what he's preaching? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know what the last words in the Old Testament are? Repent. So 400 years, generations later, brand new situation, brand new messenger. What does he say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus comes and he's baptized. Brand new messenger like there's never been before. And what's the message of Jesus? Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus went through all of their villages preaching what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The disciples were given in Luke chapter 24 this charge that repentance and the remission of sins should be preached among all nations. In the book of Acts, we see in chapter 2, verse 30, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. They're all convicted and said, what are we going to do? You know what he says? Repent. The message never changed. 
Then you turn to the back of the book, the book of the Revelation. And Jesus has some letters to seven churches of Asia. And four different times you'll see in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, he tells these churches, repent and get back to what you were doing before. You see, they had some problems. They had been backslidden. And now we have the Old Testament, the New Testament, the back of the book, the message never changes. Now, what is the message of repentance? Turn to God away from sin. That's repentance. That's repentance. So the message of repentance stays the same. The same message that was delivered to Eli months before was delivered to Samuel, and he said, you tell this to Eli. And he did. But you know, the message of his love remains true as well. If God's message on one part doesn't change, his message on the other part doesn't change. And I'm so glad that when we talk about sin and his ugliness and the need for repentance, this is in the Bible as well. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That hadn't changed. And then in chapter 10, of course, we say, we see, of course, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you'll be saved. Verse 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That hadn't changed. That's still relevant and true. And God will still honor that prayer from a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That hadn't changed. Aren't we glad that God's word doesn't change according to the winds of public opinion? But here's something else that hadn't changed. Maybe you're here, and, and you're already saved. You say, well, this, this doesn't apply to me, but I, I know this does. And perhaps we need to hear this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and you'll find rest for your soul. You know what me laboring or heavy laden me? Man, you're working so hard, but you're so loaded down. That message hadn't changed either. You see, we take comfort in knowing the message of God hadn't changed. I don't know what, what you need today. As we prepare for an invitation on him, but let me say this. If you're here and you've said no to God yesterday, the year before, two years before, the same message you've said no to is still true today. God's not going to change. Perhaps you're here, though, and you have to say, I, I'm tired. I'm tired. And I'm dealing with some stuff. That message hadn't changed either. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you some rest. Maybe something in your heart you need to talk to God as we stand and sing.